You split from your mother's brood pouch into water so cold it feels like knives against your shell. But something's wrong with you. Your seventh pair of legs is missing, and you're slower than everyone else. Your mother doesn't notice. She's already crawling away, her body hollow and starving after four months of not eating while she carried you. You try to follow your siblings down to the seafloor, but your missing legs make you drift sideways. Then you notice something worse. You're sinking toward a shadow that's rising fast. A six-scale shark. Its mouth opens, and three of your siblings disappear in one bite. You pull your body into a ball, hoping your shell looks like a rock instead of breakfast. The shark's nose bumps you hard enough to send you spinning. Then something insane happens. A hagfish shoots past you and slams directly into the shark's eye. Not to attack it, just swims straight into the shark's face by accident. The shark jerks away. You're stuck in the slime cloud, tumbling like you're trapped in glue. When you finally get your legs under you and look around, you're completely alone. Your siblings are gone. The shark is gone. You survived your first five minutes through pure dumb luck. And somehow, your luck is about to get way worse. With what's coming next, two weeks have passed, and you haven't eaten anything, not even the tiny flakes that supposedly drift down here. You're crawling across empty mud when you find it a crack in a rock that leads to a small cave. It's perfect. Protected. Safe. You crawl inside and finally relax for the first time since you were born. Then you hear clicking behind you. You turn around slowly. There's another isopod in here. He's huge, at least 20 inches long. His antennae are pointed straight at you. And he starts advancing. You try to back away, but you're in a dead-end cave. He gets closer. Closer. His mandibles open right in front of your face. You're about to die in the first shelter you ever found. Then he just... stops. He turns around, crawls to the back corner, and goes completely still. After five minutes, you realize something incredible. He's so slow from starvation that he can barely move. He spent all his energy just walking over to check if you were food. You just found a roommate who's too tired to kill you. For three days, you both sit in that cave not moving, not eating, just existing in the dark together, like the world's most oppressing living arrangement. Then on day four, your antennae pick up something, blood, lots of it, right outside the cave. You crawl to the entrance and see it a dead fish, the size of your body, just lying there in the open. You look back at your roommate. He hasn't moved. You could eat the whole thing yourself. You drag the fish inside. It takes 20 minutes, but you get it done. You're about to start eating when the old isopod's antenna twitches. He can smell it. Slowly, like a mountain deciding to move, he turns around and starts crawling toward the food. You have a choice. Fight him for it or share. You're six inches long. He's 20 inches, but he's also so weak he can barely walk. You could actually win this. Then you remember the pure random luck that got you into this cave in the first place. You tear the fish in half and push one piece toward him. He stops, confused. Then he starts eating. You both feast in silence. And for the first time in your life, you're not completely alone in the darkness. The next morning, you wake up and he's dead. The food was too much for his system after months of starvation. His body is already starting to decay. And you know what that means. Everything within a mile is going to come looking for an easy meal. You leave the cave and never look back. Skip forward to four weeks, you notice. Your body is getting too tight. The shell that protected you is now crushing you from the inside. You find a crack between two rocks and wedge yourself in your about to molt. And if anything finds you, you're dead. Your back half splits first. The old shell peels away and your soft new body pushes out. You can't move. You can't defend yourself. You're stuck halfway between old and new, completely helpless. Something touches your antenna. You freeze. Through your clouded senses, you detect another isopod, then another, three of them, all bigger than you, all circling. They're testing your shell with their mandibles, trying to figure out if you're soft enough to eat yet. The first one bites down on your exposed back leg. The pain shoots through your whole body, but you can't even pull away. You're stuck in the rock crack. He pulls harder, and you feel your leg starting to tear. Then the grinding sound starts above you. The rocks you're wedged between begin to shift. The other isopods scatter immediately. You pull with everything you have, and your half-molted body tears free, just as the rocks slam together where your head was seconds ago. You drag yourself away, your new shell still soft, your back leg hanging by a thread. But you're alive. But you didn't expect that something can be more worse than this was coming for you. Skip forward seven months, and your leg has fallen off completely. You're down to 13 legs now, moving even slower than before. And from the last seven months, you were just eating dead fishes and creatures that just make you feel alive but doesn't help you grow. Then one morning, Every chemical sensor in your antennae fires at once. Something massive just died nearby. You follow the scent for two hours. Other isopods are converging from every direction, and you can sense larger predators swimming overhead. When you finally reach the source, you freeze in shock. An entire whale lies dead on the seafloor. 
50 feet of meat, blubber, and organs that could feed you for years, and hundreds of creatures are already fighting for position. Hagfish are burrowing into the whale's side. A six-gill shark circles above, waiting for the smaller scavengers to expose the good parts. And everywhere, giant isopods like you are climbing over each other to reach the carcass. You push forward and sink your mandibles into the soft underbelly. The meat tears easily, and for the first time in your life, your stomach fills completely. You eat until your body swells to twice its normal size, gorging on more food than you've consumed in your entire nine months of existence. But you get greedy. You push deeper into the whale. The meat here is richer, more nutrient-dense, and you're eating so much that you can barely move. That's when the body shifts. The six-gill shark has decided it's his turn, and he rams the carcass hard enough to cave in the ribs. You're inside the whale when the weight crushes down. Your shell holds, but you're trapped in a collapsing cage of bone and rotting meat. You push against the ribs with all 13 legs. For 10 minutes, you're certain you'll die here, entombed in the food that was supposed to save you. Then the shark bites through the rib cage right next to your head, and the pressure releases. You scramble out through the hole, covered in whale fat and gasping for water. The shark's eye tracks you as you escape, but he's more interested in the meat you just abandoned. You crawl 20 feet away and collapse. So full, you literally can't walk properly. You just learn the second rule of deep sea survival. Every meal might be your last, but eating too much might kill you faster than starving. Skip forward to three years. That whale made you stomach full. For three years, and you're massive now, 15 inches long, covered in scars. One of the biggest isopods in your territory. You've survived everything. Sharks, starvation. You're basically a legend. That's when she appears. A female isopod, even bigger than you. Crawling across your territory like she owns it. Your instincts fire up. This is it. This is what you've been waiting for. You approach her carefully, and she doesn't run. The mating takes 30 seconds. No romance, no connection, just biology. When it's done, she turns to leave, but then she stops. Her antennae point back at you, and for a moment, something weird happens. She moves closer again, touches your shell with her antenna once, then crawls away into the darkness. You just had the closest thing to an emotional moment that's possible in the deep sea. Three months later, you're crawling across the same area when you find shells, 20 of them, all empty, scattered across the mud. Nearby is a larger shell, her shell. She died here after laying the eggs, just like your mother did. The babies hatched, crawled away, and she became food for the very predator she was trying to protect them from. You're a father to 20 babies you'll never meet, born to a mother who died the same way yours did. The cycle continues, and you're part of it now. For the first time in your life, you feel something close to sadness. Then, you feel something else, a sharp pain in your back leg. You spin around and see a juvenile isopod attached to you, trying to eat your leg while you were distracted. He's one of your own children, and he has no idea you're his father. You shake him off and watch him scurry away into the darkness. Welcome to Parenting in the Deep Sea. Skip forward two more years. You don't know where your children's are. You don't care too, and you're old now by isopod standards. Your shell is covered in scars and pitted with bacterial infections that are slowly eating through your armor. Parasitical worms have colonized your digestive tract, stealing whatever scarce nutrients you manage to absorb. You haven't eaten anything substantial. The starvation has reached a point where your body is digesting its own muscles just to keep you alive. You can barely move, and your antennae have lost their sensitivity to all but the strongest chemical signals. Then, you smell it blood. Fresh blood. Clothes. You force your legs to move, dragging your failing body toward the source. Every step takes enormous effort, but hunger pushes you forward. When you reach it, you find something, an alligator carcass, dropped from the surface as part of some human research experiment. You don't know what it is or why it's here. You just know it's meat. You attack the soft tissue under its front leg. Other isopods arrive, and together you break through the hide by focusing on the weak points, armpits, eyes, the soft underbelly. For 18 hours, you feast. You crawl inside the body cavity and eat from the inside out consuming organs that are still fresh enough to give you real nutrients. Your body swells with food, and for the first time in years, you feel something close to satisfaction. But your body is too damaged to process it. The parasites in your gut multiply explosively with the sudden influx of nutrition, blocking your digestive system. The bacterial infection in your shell spreads faster as your immune system struggles to manage both healing and digestion. You crawl away from the feeding site, gorged and dying. Your legs stop working one by one as the infection spreads through your nervous system. You collapse into the mud, your shell finally giving up after five years of holding back pressure that should have crushed you flat. In your last moments, you can still smell the alligator. Other isopods are still feeding, their mandibles clicking against bones that will be picked clean in 51 days. They'll survive off this carcass for months, maybe years. But you won't be there to see it. 
Your shell will join the thousands of others scattered across the deep sea floor. Five years of surviving the most hostile environment on Earth ended by the one thing you needed most, food. And believe it or not, there's an animal with an even worse life. Watch that story next.